Chapter Sixteen Tale. The next night, another neighborhood counting. A traitor among us! The block leader shouts. Uncle's disappearance has been discovered. How did they find out so fast? They've been to the school and questioned Abaji. I know what he said. That he doesn't know where Uncle is. What else could he say? The military police have raided Uncle's shop and found evidence of an illegal Korean newspaper. Uncle is now a criminal, wanted for treason against the empire. A house-to-house -house search. The soldiers spend the longest time at our house. We stand outside for nearly two hours, still there when everyone else has gone back to their homes. At last, soldiers come out. We start to go inside, but the officer in charge of the search speaks to Abaji. You are wanted for more questioning at police headquarters, he says. Then he nods at two other soldiers, who step forward to take Abaji by the arms. But Abaji holds up his hands to stop them. There is no need, he says. Quiet, like always. I will come with you, willingly. He watched helplessly as he is taken away. I can't keep still. I stand up a dozen times, go to the door, look toward the gate. Finally, I say to Amoni, "It's been a long time. I think I should go to the headquarters and see." No, she doesn't even let me finish my sentence. Her voice is like cold steel. You are not to leave this house. Now sit down. She never talks to me like that. I sit down meekly. No arguing with that voice. Sunny and Amoni are sewing. I try to study, but I keep seeing Abaji's face, bruised and battered, like Uncle's that time. I have to go back in my book again and again, rereading the sentences I've just read. We sit like that, the three of us. Together in the middle of the room, for half the night, Amoni doesn't say we should go to bed. She doesn't even seem to notice we're there. At last, footsteps outside the gate. I rush to the door. Abaji is fine. Not a single mark on him. He looks surprised to see us still awake. They questioned me. He says I could not tell them anything, so they let me go. I know it's thanks to Uncle. He told us almost nothing about his underground work to protect us, all of us. If the authorities thought Abaji knew anything, they've have bitten it out of him. Amoni rattles around in the kitchen making tea for Abaji. She tells us to go to bed right away. A million questions in my mind. I lie down on my side, facing toward where Uncle usually sleeps. Right away, I turn over onto my other side, but that doesn't help. I can still feel the empty space in my back. I think I'm going to be awake all night. The room feels so cold without Uncle there. But I fall asleep almost the second I close my eyes, as if my mind needs somewhere to hide. Guards are posted at our house, watching and following everyone in the family all day long. After about a week, they aren't there around the clock anymore. But they still come by several times a day. It makes us all nervous. We are never sure when a soldier might suddenly show up. It seems impossible that our lives can go on with Uncle gone. But except for the soldiers, everything is back to normal. Sunny and I go to school. Abaji to work. Amoni keeps house. Normal, but not normal. I think of Uncle all the time. We'd have heard if he'd been caught. So he must have escaped, but where is he? Is he alone? Is anyone helping him? Will he ever be able to come home? It's so hard to get used to him not being around. I miss his stories, doing things with him in our workshop. Most of all, his little jokes, the way he always makes us laugh. Abaji never makes jokes. Our house feels so much quieter and sadder now. At first, I was angry at Sunhee, but I couldn't stay that way, not for long. Not the way she looks now, pale, with circles under her eyes. I try to forget about it, about what she's done. Abuji is right. It doesn't matter how it happened. Uncle is gone. That's what matters. The day after Abuji went to the police station, Amoni tells me to carve some balls out of gourds from the garden. Our brass ones are gone. 
taken away by the Japanese. I go out to the workshop. Most of the tools are gone too. But we've kept an axe and a knife. I split the hard gourds in half, smooth the bottom halves with a knife, and scrape them with a piece of broken glass so they'll sit flat. I spend most of the afternoon working. Sunny comes out before dinner to fetch the bowls. I hand her the stack, bottom side up, so she can see what I've done. With a knife tip, I've carved something on the underside of each bowl. She frowns when she takes the bowls, almost turns them over, but then she sees it a faint circle with a wavy line across it. Sunny looks at it, then at me, and smiles. Small. But still a smile. Weeks go by, then months. I'm surprised to find that sometimes I don't think about uncle for hours, sometimes even all day. I feel guilty. It's strange to realize that I could get used to him being gone. It's partly because we're all so busy with war activities. There's a new project at school. Once a week, my classmates and I march into the hillside forest to gather pine roots. The roots are loaded into carts and taken away by the military. They use the resin to clean aircraft and weapons. We all know what it means. Japanese supplies are low. Coal, oil, things like that. The war is using up everything too fast. Splinters and scratches. Amani works on my hands at night. First, she takes out splinter after splinter. Then, she rubs herb stuff. On the cuts and scratches. Stickiness everywhere. The pine sap gets all over my clothes. And the smell, no matter how much I wash. Funny, I used to love the smell of fresh pine. Now I hate it. One day at school, there is an announcement, an exciting one. The Japanese are going to build an airstrip just outside town. I can hardly believe it. An airstrip? Planes would actually land here? Teacher asks for volunteers to help build it. Mine is the first hand raised. I talked to Aboji that night after supper. I volunteer to help build the airstrip, I say. Aboji sips his tea. It's not real tea anymore. It's herbs from the garden, but we still call it tea. How often will you be called on to work there? He asks. I was afraid he'd ask that, and I know he won't like the answer. The work on the airstrip is to be done every day. I say slowly. Anyone who volunteers will be excused from their studies until it's finished. I hold my breath and try not to look away from him. He frowns. Your education is important, Teo. I know what I want to say, but not how he'll take it. Aboji, I do not mean to contradict you, but if the lessons were worthwhile, I would never even consider missing school. Silence. He knows what I mean. My lessons. The sayings of the emperor. The victories of the imperial forces. The superiority of Japanese culture. That's what I'll be missing. Is there a look of pain on his face? Or am I only imagining it? In the evenings, you will study kanji and reading with Sunny, he says. Permission granted. I suck in my cheeks to keep from smiling. Yes, Abuji, thank you. Later, I think about it again. I wasn't imagining things. It does hurt him to know that my lessons aren't what I should be learning. I realize something else. Why he has never punished me for not being a better scholar. The same reason. A few days later, my new life as a worker begins. Every morning, I march off with the other volunteers to the field where the airstrip is being built. We're given spades or shovels, then we dig and move dirt all day long, bossed by soldiers. I didn't expect this. I thought we'd be supervised by our teachers. The soldiers are a lot crueler. Punishment is a big stroke with a bamboo cane across your legs, but standing with a shovel held over your head. For a long time, hours even, some students get slapped hard in the face for working too slowly or not saluting respectfully enough. 
I make certain never to be punished. If I am, Abuji will make me stop working at the airstrip, make me go back to school. I listen carefully, obey orders quickly. It's hard work, but it beats going to school. Blisters. At night, I sometimes wake from the pain. Omoni soaks rags, ties them onto my hands. Soon, I have calluses instead of blisters, and then a thick layer of skin, tough as leather. Two months after I start at the airstrip, I come home with a new badge on my collar, the Japanese flag with wings. Sunny notices right away, raises her eyebrows at me, then at the pin. Asking but without words, she's still so quiet. All the volunteers got one, I say. I glance down at the pin. We are now members of the Japanese Youth Air Corps. If airplanes ever land on the airstrip, the Youth Air Corps will be allowed to greet them. We might even get to clean the planes or polish them or whatever they do with them. I look at her. Just think, we'll be right there on the field when the planes land and take off. And while they're here, I might get to see the inside of one. Maybe even sit in the pilot seat. Sunny doesn't seem that impressed, but at least she says something. In a whisper, that's good, Oppa. Will the planes be coming soon? I shake my head. Not soon. We have to finish the airstrip first. How do you expect planes to come here if they don't have anywhere to land? She doesn't know the first thing about planes.